Chicago, Diana, Princess of Wales, does what she does best, flies the flag as Britain's most popular ambassador. Another American visit again proved her success in her public role. Privately, as the marriage partner for Prince Charles, she's been a disaster. Fifteen years ago, she seemed the ideal choice. We all loved Diana, and we thought she was perfect, and we wished her on him. He knew he had to get married. He knew there was a lot of pressure on him to hurry up and make up his mind. And she was a sweet, adorable girl, and exactly the type that he'd always fancied, gorgeous blonde with lovely long legs. It was easy to fall in love with Diana. It was easy to persuade yourself that she was perfect. She was perfect for anybody. With The whole country was in love with her. With hindsight, it's now obvious that Charles should have married a very different kind of woman, someone like the horsey, strong-minded Camilla Parker Bowles. Charles met her when they were both in their early 20s, but she became tired of waiting for him to make up his mind. Charles knew Camilla and began his uh, affair with her uh, when he was in his dithering phase, really, his Hamlet phase. He came late to discovering that he was an ex officio sex symbol and that women were at his feet and began to rather enjoy it in his mid to late twenties in and out of the navy um, at a time when other people certainly other princes of Wales are thinking it's time to get married and start breeding children he postponed it longer than uh, any prince of Wales for several hundred years by the time he actually finally got married in his early thirties and I think that just was that he was playing the field while he had the chance he knew he wasn't going to be king for a very long time the lineup of his girlfriends included Davina Sheffield, an accomplished horsewoman, the actress Susan George, the Duke of Wellington's daughter, Lady Jane Wellesley, and Sabrina Guinness, spirited member of the Brewing family. He was most in love with Anna Wallace, who showed him a passion for life that he'd never previously known. Charles was certainly infatuated by Anna Wallace. She was a very lively and high-spirited and very beautiful woman. She wasn't prepared to pay sec second fiddle to anyone, including the Prince of Wales, which made it, of course, very difficult for Charles to seriously contemplate getting engaged to, to Anna. She was a mature girl, and she realised that uh, Camilla Parker Bowles was not going to let go. She saw the way they danced together. She saw the attraction, and that was it. Camilla fought off another rival for Charles's affections amongst his married friends. He was known very well for a long time to be very close to uh, Lady Dale Tryon, known as Kanga, who has a clothes shop called Kanga, that was his nickname for her, um, who uh, reputedly, with Mrs Parker Bowles, headed the committee of Charles's married women friends who chose Diana, ironically, as his bride because she was somebody too young to make much of a fuss if he strayed. We know this from her brother-in-law, Richard Parker Bowles, who has said this, that she encouraged the match because she thought Diana would be easy to manipulate. I don't think you can ignore the words of a brother-in-law. He said that she was a wrecker. She didn't, couldn't bear to see other people happy. By keeping Camilla as his mistress, Charles is following family tradition. His great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII, was a repeatedly unfaithful husband. He had to wait until he was 59 before his mother died and he could become king. Without a proper job, country pursuits and mistresses dominated his life. His great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII, Victoria's son, when Prince of Wales, notoriously had many affairs and continued to after becoming king. Uh, this, of course, was in a different age when, A, his wife did shut up and look the other way and was very long-suffering and kind enough to invite his favourite mistress to see him on his deathbed. And that favourite mistress, Mrs Alice Keppel, just happens to be the great-grandmother of Mrs Camilla Parker Bowles, as Camilla reputedly reminded the prince on one of their first meetings. And my great-grandmother was your great-great-grandfather's mistress. How about it then, she supposedly said to him, but of course he lives in a different age, a more intrusive media age, an age where Diana decided to become a feminist icon by stamping her foot and not looking the other way. And if he thinks there's a royal tradition of getting away with it, I'm afraid he's been rumbled. In the early 90s, the media could still only speculate from afar on the goings-on behind palace walls. The hypocrisy of the United Family Front was exposed by two royal insiders. Diana and Sarah have, have brought the uh, 600 millimeter Nikon lens 
right into the bedrooms of the royal family, and in some cases into the beds. I think it was good for all of us in many ways to have this family that was so high profile and uh, behaved uh, so badly in many, many cases. It's so good for all of us to be able to see that because it's like a mirror in which we see ourselves. And Diana actually caused this to happen. Diana and Sarah Ferguson between them. Uh, they put the, the royal family and family behavior on the map. And for this, we have to thank them. The long history of royal infidelity stems from a recurring psychological problem. The men in the royal families that have gone back over the generations have had one thing that is, goes right through all of them, a kind of pattern. And that is that they've not really particularly liked women. And the reason for this is that for the most part, certainly over the last four or five generations, their mothers have not really had time for them. So on the one hand, they're looking for the mother that they never had. So they're looking for one woman after another because they'll never find this mother anywhere. So they're searching. And on the other hand, there's a, a feeling of hostility within them directed towards all women whom they scapegoat for what it was that their own mothers had not given them. At the turn of the century, Queen Mary was a distant and overly strict mother to her six children by King George V. This laid the foundations for her eldest son David's liking for mature, married women, culminating in his infatuation with the twice-married Wallace Simpson. When his father died in 1936, the Bachelor Prince of Wales succeeded him as King Edward VIII. God save the King! But behind the scenes, the new king's love affair was all-consuming. Wallace fascinated him. For one thing, being an American, she wasn't really in awe of the king as much as, as, as a British woman would have been. She spoke her mind. She was a woman, a very confident woman of the world. She spoke to him as an equal. She wasn't as deferential as most people were. Certainly all those Debs that he met here were terrified of him. He didn't ever like young, unmarried girls. That out. All his mistresses were women with husbands, that's what he liked, a confident woman, a bossy woman, a woman who knew her way around in the world, and uh, the Duchess of Windsor, Wallace Simpson, was a supreme bossy woman all their life. She simply bossed him, she's a woman who had two husbands living, and very self-confident, and this, this, I think, is what appealed to him more than anything. One hears stories that there was some kind of sexual allure. I think this is nonsense. You don't give up your throne for sex. I mean, you could have sex any, any time. If, you, if you're a king, you don't really have to give up your throne in order to have uh, some kind of happy sexual relationship with a woman. It was something far deeper, far more important than simply a sexual trick or a sexual allure. What he wanted was a woman who would dominate him, and this is, this is certainly what he got. Once again, there's a married, now divorced woman romantically involved with a future king. History may be repeating itself. Camilla is a latter-day Wallace Simpson. You know, you've got a rather dominant woman who stands out, different from the other girlfriends. You've got somebody who's rather masculine. There's a mannish jaw, mannish hands, and a very masculine voice. And there's a tendency to take over the home, like Wallace Simpson took over Fort Belvedere. Um, Camilla has taken over Highgrove. While Diana stayed in London, Highgrove became Camilla Parker Bowles' territory. Living just down the road, she's always been at his beck and call. Also, there's the feeling that Camilla is the only person that's ever understood Charles, the only woman he's ever really, of his own age, that he's ever really been able to relate to in any way at all. As a young man, Charles found kindred spirits in a much older generation. In particular, he found sympathy and encouragement in his great uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten. This forceful character filled the emotional gap left by his busy, absent parents from an early age, and he became both mentor and surrogate father to the sensitive, unconfident prince. Mountbatten was very concerned about the type of woman a Prince of Wales should marry. Charles reflected his teachings in a television interview when he was 20. When you marry, in my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is going to become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think, who, who could fulfill this particular role. Because people like you, perhaps, would expect quite a lot from somebody like that. And it's got to be somebody pretty special. When Charles made that assessment, Diana Spencer was only eight years old. 
Other members of the royal family, particularly the Queen Mother, were uneasy about Mountbatten's deep influence over the heir to the throne. They were quite worried, I think, that Charles would um, perhaps become too involved with Mountbatten and some of his more peculiar friends. And the Queen Mother was always a counterbalance to Mountbatten's influence. The Queen Mother would be the, the soft feminine shoulder he could cry on, as he literally did. And Mountbatten, the man he could confide his love secrets in. At Broadlands, his home in Hampshire, Mountbatten planned for the future of his family. Mountbatten wanted Charles to marry his granddaughter, Amanda Latchpool, rather than Diana Spencer, who was the Queen Mother's candidate, because that would have been yet another step in cementing the Mountbatten dynasty. His father had been disgraced and, um, and uh, pushed out of office during World War I because he, he had a, all these German connections and the German family name. And so Earl Mountbatten devoted his life, I think, to repairing that damage and restoring the prestige of his family. And that would have been the ultimate for him, to have his granddaughter become Queen of England. In 1979, Mountbatten was murdered by the IRA while on a family holiday in Ireland. For Charles, the loss had a devastating effect. His great uncle was um, a surrogate father for him. He loved Mountbatten, and I think Mountbatten loved him. And uh, he was different from Philip in that he was much more understanding of Charles's needs. He wasn't so harsh. He wasn't so demanding of him. And uh, I think Charles needed somebody like him. And when he died, it was a tremendous shock. It took him a while to get over that. Mountbatten died in August '79. And at that time, Charles had become involved with uh, what the press called a mystic miss, an Indian lady with whom he formed an intense relationship. There's a particular woman, an Indian woman, Zoe Salis, who was actually 10 years older than he was, um, and who had a child from the uh, actor, John Houston. And uh, she was able to provide him with an enormous amount of comfort in a motherly sort of way, because she was, in fact, a mother herself. But not only from that point of view, but being a, an Indian woman, she also represented something more mystical for him. She was a sort of guru. He continued to see Zoe Salis right up until uh, certainly the summer of 1980, when he had already met and was starting to court Diana Spencer. At 32, Charles was still clinging to Mountbatten's golden rule of safety in numbers when it came to women. Mountbatten was on record as saying before Charles's marriage that he should play the field as much as possible, uh, which of course Charles did in his 20s, being a bit of a late bloomer in that department as in some others, which of course is why he missed the chance to marry Camilla Shand, now Camilla Parker Bowles, which may have altered his life in many ways. Camilla married cavalry officer Andrew Parker Bowles in 1973, yet she remained the major emotional force in Charles's life. It seemed that she and Andrew had an understanding about Charles that suited them both. All she had to do was find him a compliant wife. With all his contemporaries married, the Prince of Wales now realised that he must find a future queen and do his duty of producing heirs. Enter Lady Diana Spencer, an innocent teenager who seemed to fit the bill. A few days after her 19th birthday, she sat in a haystack with Charles and told him how much she sympathised with him over Mountbatten's death. And he was quite taken with this, he was quite charmed. But she was a kid, just a kid to him, just a child. She was an adolescent, she was a girl who'd hardly ever been abroad. She knew very little about life. She spent her, her, most of her time in London looking after young children. She was very unworldly. And she came from a dysfunctional family and she was looking for love, she was looking for stability. She thought she would find it with Charles. But Charles at the time was thrown into emotional turmoil. He'd lost the man who was in some ways a father figure to him, was suffering grief, bereavement, and his own love life and emotional life were in a mess at the time. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Whatever love meant to Charles, he looked far from at ease in the role of bridegroom, a victim of royal duty and his own indecision. 
Diana, swept up in the romance of it all, had no idea what had really been going on behind the scenes. It was a plot, it was a scheme. They found Lady Diana Spencer fitted the identikit. And he was hastily pushed towards marriage. I mean, he was very uncertain himself, as he has said. He felt his father was pushing him, which is true, and also his mother was pushing him. And as it turns out, his mistress was pushing him. I think it was all very unfair because he, he wasn't ready to make that decision. They should have left him a couple of years after Mountbatten's death to, to make up his own mind and get to know Diana a little bit better and to make that decision properly and to leave her the opportunity to see if that was the man of her dreams. Everyone expected them to live happily ever after, as in all the best fairy tales. In reality, they couldn't have been more ill-matched, and even Charles's choice of where to spend their wedding night was tainted by his relationship with Camilla. Broadlands was where Mountbatten had allowed his great-nephew to have his love affairs. He worked out what we call a love plan. He decided that poor Prince Charles was too exposed to, to the press and also he didn't like the idea of him having to conduct his romances in his mother's house. So Lord Mountbatten was very kind and he lent him Broadlands, mostly at weekends, which he could use as a little love nest. So he used to take his girlfriends there, and notably one Camilla Shand, who was there many a weekend in late 72. Diana unwittingly joined the list of Charles's Broadland conquests. The truth came as a shock. When Diana learnt that she was sleeping in a bed that Camilla may indeed once have slept in, this would have, only, this would have added to the kind of build-up of anger and angst and hostility, that uh, she was a woman without a past and she really wanted her husband to be without a past too. As they continued their honeymoon aboard Britannia, Diana was already realising Camilla's emotional hold over Charles. I think there's enough evidence that Charles was seeing Mrs. Parker Bowles before, during and after that wedding, including the week leading up to the wedding, and of course the keepsakes of her on the honeymoon falling out of his pockets and so on were the beginning of the end of the marriage as soon as it had begun. But while on honeymoon at Balmoral, they seemed typically loving newlyweds. They seemed besotted by each other. Certainly the prince was very, very devoted to his wife. I remember in 1983, on her very first tour abroad in Australia, six weeks they had in Australia and New Zealand, and he was so proud of her and the great triumph she had on that first trip. And he was constantly touching her, reassuring her, patting her hand. All the actions, we thought then, of a, a loving husband. But once home, Charles slipped into old habits. He was unable to understand or cope with Diana, struggling under the pressures of her public role and Camilla's presence. In desperation, she turned for support to a man who was constantly at her side. Barry Manneke was Diana's bodyguard in the crucial years of, of 85 to 86, when Charles said that his marriage was irretrievably broken down. Um, various suggestions have been made um, that perhaps Diana and the bodyguard had an affair. What, what is pretty certain is that Charles was very jealous of Diana's closeness to her bodyguard and that he discovered this closeness days before Fergie's wedding. In the mid-80s, he sadly died in a, when his motorbike he was riding through the city of London was in collision with a car. It was at the Cannes Film Festival in 1987 that Diana learnt of Manneke's sudden death. How she heard reveals the acrimonious nature of the Wales' marriage. Charles was told that Manneke had died. Diana did not know they were going to a function that night. As the door was opened for Diana to get out, Charles leant across and said, oh, by the way, Manneke is dead. It would have been kinder to have hit her. The loss of this trusted confidant increased Diana's vulnerability. It was then that she started her most serious affair with the cavalry officer, Major James Hewitt. Charles seemed to consider him a better choice than a policeman. Well, Manneke came from a fairly ordinary background, but Hewitt was in the officer class. One might say just, but he was in it, and he played polo. So he was one of the chaps. And the story is that Charles didn't really mind that Diana was seeing Hewitt 
because Hewitt was taking this troublesome wife off his hands. But it was only when Hewitt started selling a few stories to the papers that Charles began to, to raise a few objections. James Hewitt has now retired to a newly acquired property in the West Country. For Diana, his betrayal hurt. I think Diana quite clearly feels very let down by James Hewitt. I think she made that clear in the Panorama program. She was honest enough to admit that she loved him, that they'd had an affair. Uh, he capitalized on it in that dreadful book written by Anna Pasternak, which subsequently became a dreadful film. But there's no doubt that Hewitt emerges as a pretty venal and uh, unattractive figure from the level to which he's stooped to capitalize on what was a love affair, whoever it was with. Other men in Diana's life included James Gilby, a car salesman and old friend from before her marriage. Their relationship was confirmed when tapes of a bugged telephone conversation between them became public. She also turned to art dealer Oliver Hoare for sympathy and attention. England's rugby captain, Will Carling, also offered his support before his own marriage broke down. So far, she hasn't chosen her men friends well. I think Diana is in need of love. She's a woman with an enormous capacity for giving love and a capacity for receiving it, who's been denied it throughout her marriage and in many ways throughout her life. Let's not forget that her parents broke up when she was six. Her mother rather unusually left, uh, leaving her in the custody of her father, unusual for the day. Um, she regards her life as a series of betrayals and uh, if she occasionally chooses the wrong man, I think that's because she's had a pretty tough life and I think her real friends are worried that whenever a dashing subaltern does come along and sweep her off her feet, she may get swept away by another wrong -un. Charles still seems to only have eyes for Camilla. The reason for their enduring relationship is the same as it's always been. I think the basic attraction really was sex. She was a woman who used sex as a bait, a lure, and I think a controlling device with Charles. And he may think of her as a comfort cushion and the nanny and all the things that the press have uh, said about her. But I think in the end, you've got to take the evidence of the, the Camilla Gate tape and the banter on that tape and the fact that they were making the next appointment for uh, a tryst. You've got to take the eyewitness accounts, which the, the tabloid press has been for. And amusing as those tales often are, I mean, they do in the end boil down to a sexual relationship. For the British monarchy, the lid is well and truly off Pandora's box of unhappy marriages and royal infidelities. There's no going back to a time when royal wives towed the line. There's no doubt that, that Diana and, and Fergie have, between them in different ways, done enormous damage to the House of Windsor, wittingly or unwittingly. Uh, it's not them alone. Uh, Charles and Andrew must take responsibility, and Edward to some extent as well, the younger generation as a whole. But I think that the monarchy, by chewing up these girls and spitting them out and thinking they're rid of them with these divorces, is making a very big mistake, especially if it's not seen to treat them properly as ex-royals. Fergie's more of a liability than Diana, but I think between them they can continue to do damage to the House of Windsor from whatever distance for the rest of their lives. Despite her divorce from Charles, Diana's power base as the people's royal favorite is still secure. But her adoring public could become a double-edged sword. Now free to marry again, in their eyes, what man could possibly make such an idolized woman happy?